Urmish Partha Sarathi. Very good. You are here, <laughs> Sports Tech Tokyo. Um, you know, you meet all kinds of different people at a convention like this, and there are a lot of folks who specialize in one area or another. I think what's unique about you is you've, you've walked the walk in a lot of different areas, so that puts you in a pretty unique place to be a mentor and to evaluate kind of what's going on here over the next few days. It is. Um, I think there's, 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 there's three things here. One, in terms of actually across the sports value chain, mm -hmm. when you're looking at the sales side and the buy side, the federations and the broadcasters, yeah. and then the agencies in the middle. So having done that, across all three of the segments helps. Yep. And the second thing is I spent a, a decade in Europe, Middle East and Africa, and then I spent a decade in Asia. Yeah. Uh, at very interesting times. The decade in EMEA was very much around the first dot-com boom. Okay. Um, and this, uh, the decade in Asia has been very much around this whole bizarre cusp where they've got free to air is growing, pay TV is growing, print is growing, digital okay. is growing, which is unprecedented. So right. the economics that are required to capture value are quite varied. Yeah, and so within that, you've been different places in your career on the forefront of things. Mm -hmm. So you come here to a place like this, everybody's trying to push things of the future. Everybody has different ideas of what that future looks like. For you, what do you see? Where is sports tech going? I think there's a distinction to be made between a product mm -hmm. and a proposition. Sure. I think um, just as, you know, with anything with a name tech in it, yep. you tend to productize an experience, which is good, but to actually scale it and monetize it, uh, by scale I mean consumer adoption, and by monetizing I mean actually you know, clients and cash flow, you need to think about it from a marketing perspective, brand, pricing, repeatability, differentiation, barriers to entry, which is very different than when you're actually doing a design thinking workshop in the first place, yeah. when you come up with your MVP. So that, that, that jump from product to proposition is key. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, easy, it's, it's harder than people think it is. So how do you work within that space to get that jump as sweet as possible? I primarily work with three different types of uh, clients. One is actually federation leagues and clubs, or event promoters, which is very much a sort of fixed fee piece. The other is a lot of digital tech and content companies looking to come into Asia where it's a, it's a foundation fee to do the strategy and then actually walk the walk over 12 months uh, with a retainer plus upside so that at the end of 12 months they actually have a situation where they can decide. Yeah. Should we set up an office? In which case there's another piece of work in terms of where, what jurisdiction, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or should we say, you know, we'll park it or we'll, and we'll carry on the way we are at the moment. And the third area actually, which is far more interesting, yeah. but it's a lot of love and fresh air yeah. rather than money for our school bills, is very much <laughs> in, in, at the intersection of what I broadly call uh, sort of tech, mobile, okay. and storytelling. Yeah. Because that's very diverse. If you look at esports, it's mm -hmm. fundamentally at the confluence of music, youth, and gaming. Okay. The fact that he's got sports in it often can be a misnomer because the, the economics are very, very different. Well, the average person isn't going to think music with esports, right? Yeah. That's probably the piece that they're not necessarily wrapping their brains around. I mean, if you look at, if you look at say, League of Legends, yeah. right? If you look at Dota 2, if you look at the League of Legends annual event in, in Ichion, in Korea, mm -hmm. uh, it was known for the music performance mm -hmm. of the K-pop stars. Yeah. Uh, and then, yes, there was a League of Legends battle at the end of it also. But it's actually rep representative of, of, of youth culture, yeah. where you know, their whole sense of entertainment is not as defined right. as whether it's sport or music or gaming. It's a combination of all three. Do you ever see it getting to a point where that sort of, I guess, elasticity of interest can keep scaling up to older demographics? Or is that sort of a thing that you think is inherent to youth and so you lose that as you get older? Great point. Um, I think it's going to be different in Asia vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be definitely different in emerging markets Asia, so X, Korea, Japan, China, and the rest of Asia. Yeah. Because the demographics, 40 to 50% of the emerging markets Asia population is below the age of 30. So if I'm looking at demographic dividend over the next 10 years, they're going to be in the game yeah. all the way through. Right. If you look at it from a European perspective, I'm keeping the US out because US is quite a unique beast. Okay. If you can look at a European perspective, the, the demographic dividend has been there for the last 20 years. Yeah. So they're the other end of the cusp. Yep. So if I'm a J-League club in Japan, or if I'm yeah. an A-League club in Australia, or an Indian uh, soccer league, the way I'm looking at esports is very different than the way any of the European football clubs or leagues are looking at it. For me, it's much more about actually going out there and engaging with the fans and getting to know them from a first party data perspective. Yep. Where for the European clubs, it's much more to your point, actually saying, okay, how can I really extend this yeah, so yeah. that my core demographic does not fall into the late 40s and 50s, right. which is what the American leagues have got now. Yeah, that's, you know, and that transitions what I was going to ask you next, which is the U.S. is its own beast. So yeah. what is their problem? What is their issue? And how do you see that evolving? I don't see any problem. I mean, the U.S. is by far in the history of civilization the most. They've had 50 years of peace. 
this. Mm-hmm. And that, it's, it, these, these things are important. True, Until true, true. you don't feel it, you know, it's, it's, that, that's it, a good point. They've had feet, they've had peace, they've had political leadership, they've yep. had a, do, a currency which has been dominating. Yep. They've had GDP growth growing at between 6 and 16% year on year, which is massive. That means you're fundamentally doubling your GDP every, at least once a decade. Yep. And they've been able to actually drive innovation because of the lack of regulation or the light touch regulation. Yep. So if you look at banking, if you look at, uh, if you look at pharmaceuticals, if you look at automobiles, if you look at tech, yeah. those are the four largest engines. Um, the challenge is very much going to be where you start having a, um, uh, an issue around the, the economics of attention. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the, the business model of the four leagues, at least the top three leagues in the US, is very much television heavy. Right. Which is not necessarily the case of um, sports economics in Asia. Mm-hmm. Because OTT plays a role, yeah. print plays a role, because literacy is still going up. Yeah. So you have this very, very bizarre um, situation in Asia where there are four or five different types of media platforms which actually are raising the profile of the sport and hence grabbing the attention of the fan. Yeah. Um, typically, typically, you'd have somebody who sort of is awake 16 to 18 hours a day. Yeah. Typically, 20% of that is spent on leisure. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. That's about three to four hours. Yeah. You take away social and you take away e-commerce, you're probably less with an, left with an hour. Now, the big difference between the, the mature economies in the West and Asia is commute time. There are long commutes yep. in Asia, and that creates an additional hour yeah. for consumer time. Right, right, So right. those are advantages. Whereas in the US, until you start driving, the leisure time doesn't really quite come into your equation. Sure. So to summarize, I think the challenges in the, in the US are very unique simply because it's a large, homogenous, affluent market. Yeah. So if you get onto something which is good, I think the NBA 2K League is a classic example. Yep. Or Overwatch is a classic example. Yeah. It just goes like that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in, in the emerging markets, you've got to be far more clear about, you know, what are the different platforms that you're pushing, mm-hmm. which are your success factors. Right, absolutely. You know, you mentioned we'd talked before, and certainly whether it's the external pitch, the internal pitch, you're, you're telling stories. That's how you get communication across the line. So. What, for you as a storyteller, has been the most important tool in your tool bag to wherever the situation you're in, you can communicate effectively? Listening. Yeah. It's a very underrated skill. Um, to just because somebody has not responded or said yes, or have been made anodyne in their response, doesn't necessarily mean either they've understood it, yeah. or if they've understood it, they've appreciated it. Yeah. And if they appreciate it, they actually have an idea of what next comes. Yeah. So you've got to be constantly thinking, second guessing yourself mm. to say, actually, have I been able to make my point across, not to my benefit, but to the benefit of the listener? Yeah. So for example, if I'm working with a technology company, there's a large American technology company I work with, it's very much about their sales team needs to sort of migrate by selling to the content people and the marketing people and the strategy folks in a client organization than the chief engineer or the CTO. So how do you actually help them do that? So it's actually uh, scripting, stakeholder analysis, a lot of role playing, mm-hmm. and, and you literally actually make them go through the motions. Yeah. Uh, because unless you actually help them go through an artificial scenario, when it really comes to the elevator pitch, when they're actually in the elevator with the this, with this CEO, it won't come out naturally. Yeah. So it's, it's listening, it's making sure that what you're saying is being comprehended, right? and then just keeping it very bite-sized and incremental.